I've traveled to many countries, done a lot of ministry. Our main church in, in Seattle, Victoria, we run between 1,500, 2,000 people. But for the past, well, for six months of this year, we could not have a church service with our members. And uh, we could only have our praise and worship team and our television crew. And they could, uh, we broadcast live over face, uh, Facebook, YouTube. And then in our city, I have a channel with a cable company that is 24 hours a day programs from us. And in fact, Andrew Walmack is one of the preachers on our channel. You guys don't understand how difficult it was for me to find somebody that could interpret into Spanish Andrew and speak with a Southern accent. <laughs> it's real difficult, but somehow we did it. And so Andrew's on our, on our station there in Seattle, Victoria, preaching the gospel. And, uh, you know, as was mentioned, we have a, a Bible school. We started a Bible school 42 years ago that we've trained. Uh, I don't know, he mentioned however many he said. I don't know. I don't keep up with all that. Uh, anyway, we have a Bible school that we train people for the ministry. And it's a real short-term school. It only lasts, nowadays, it only lasts six weeks. That's our Bible school. But in six weeks' time, you will study 26 different subjects. And you're going to be in, in class. You're going to be things in the afternoon. You're going to be on a service every night. And at least twice during six weeks, you're going to go out and do crusades and street evangelism. It's, it's a very practical school. And as I said, we've trained a lot of people. They've, the students, many of the students have raised up churches all across Mexico. In fact, one of our students now pastors a church in Dallas, Texas, Another student of ours past, pastors a church in Houston, Texas. And uh, we have some other churches that have been raised up in other countries. We even had a, we helped raise up a church in Israel. And we have an, an organization in the Philippines. And I don't know how many churches are part of our organization. Uh, we have an orphanage there. We've got, well, I think we, right now, I think we've got 22 kids. At one time we had 35 and then we help with an orphanage in Thailand. And our church uh, supports the Philippines, Thailand, China, Colombia, and I don't know where else. Anyway, so we're all, we're, we're doing a lot of things to reach the world. Lynn was in a ladies meeting in Mexico one time and a woman came up, she said, you remember me? And Lynn looked at her and said, well, no, not really. And uh, she said, well, my husband and I went to your Bible school. And she said, we've raised up over 50 churches here in Mexico. So we have no idea how many churches have been raised up across Mexico and other places uh, because of going, students going through our Bible school. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I make gospel tents. Paul was a tent maker. And so we've made tents and we've distributed them to many. We, we even sent one to Hungary. We sent one to... I don't know, several different places. And uh, anyway, but we use tents for crusades and all kinds of stuff. So a lot of stuff, other stuff I could share with you, but one of the things that, uh, the main thing I want to share with you today, this is the title of it. And I've, I've shared part of this before here at the school. If I never see you again, this is what I want you to know. Okay, if I never see you again, this is what I want you to know. I thought about this several times, and, and especially uh, there, there's been times in Mexico that the, the bad people have tried to kidnap us or even kill us, whatever. And, you know, I've had several experiences there of, of them shooting the back tire of my truck and, and threatening to to kidnap me and all kinds of stuff that we've gone through. And so ever so often I think about all the things we've gone through and the dangers that many times we've, we've faced in Mexico. And so I thought, well, you know, if something were to happen, uh, this is what I want you to know, all right? This is what I consider to be extremely important. Number one, the Bible is the Word of God. 
There is no other book like the Bible. It's God's word. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody does. It can never be contradicted. They can say what they want to, but the Bible stands forever. And sooner or later, everybody that has a negative opinion about the Bible will sooner or later find out that they were wrong and the Bible is right. You know, the, the Bible is like a handbook. You, you know, one time I bought a piece of equipment, a power washer. I don't know if y'all know what that is. But I bought it and I, I bought it in, in Brownsville and I took it into Mexico to our house there. And I thought, well, I'm going to check this thing out. And I hooked it up and did everything, got it ready and I turned it on and, I, and it went and that was it. And I thought, well, what in the world's wrong with it? And then I changed a few things and I tried it again and it, it wouldn't work. I said, they sold me a piece of junk. And so I put it back in the box. And next time we went to the border, I went and told them, this is a piece of junk. It doesn't work. They said, oh, we're very sorry about that. So they gave me another one. So I take it back to Mexico. I get outside. I hook it up. I turn it on. It goes. And it won't work. I'm so angry. Why would they sell a piece of junk like this? And my precious wife came to me and she said, have you looked at the manual? I said, I don't need a manual. I'm a guy. We don't look at manuals. We know how things work. She said, well, you know, I would suggest you look at the manual. So I got the manual out and I looked. I said, and I turned on it. You know, I didn't read the manual. This is this book right here is our manual. When something doesn't work, you go to the manual. This book will cause your faith to grow strong. This is what faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word. This word produces faith in you. It has the answer to every problem you'll ever face in life. And you and I must learn how to read and study and meditate in the word of God. It will stand true to the very end when this world ceases to exist. It will never go, be outdated. So we must stay with the word of God. The Bible tells us that the word of God in Hebrews chapter four, it says the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two edged sword cutting between the soul and spirit between uh, joint and mar. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So I encourage you preach the word. Amen. Amen? Wherever you go, if you're going to be a preacher, preach the word. If you're going to be a missionary, preach the word. If you're going to just have a secular job, Preach the word, share the word of God with everybody. You know, I, you know, living in Mexico, we, we hear all kinds of strange things and they're, they're talking about, well, you know, we're going to take the Bible out of, out of schools. We're going to take the Bible out of government. We're going to take the Bible out of this. We're going to take the Bible out of that. And I, and I think, why? Well, you know, it's, it's just a book, you know, well, <laughs> hey, what are you, you going to do with all the other, other books in the world? Now, if it's just a book, do you know why people of authority want to take the Bible away? Because they're afraid of it. They're afraid of the Bible, and that's why they want to get it out of the schools, get it out of the government, get it out of any place of any importance at all. They are afraid of the Bible because they know that the Bible is real, and the Bible reveals their sins and all of the stupid stuff that they're doing nowadays. Number one, the Bible is the Word of God, all right? Number two, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. There's none other. It's only Jesus. There's no other way to get into heaven except through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I was reading this morning, it's talking about the children of Israel and the kings that they had. And I tell you, they were, they were, many of them were raised up to believe God and his word. And over a long period of time, all of a sudden they began to, to 
stray and begin to believe in other gods. On one, I was reading one this morning and said, this guy, you know, he said, well, I don't want people to go back to Israel. I want them to stay here with me. And so I'm going to create, he, he created two calves and said, this is your God. My Lord, who in the world wants to worship a calf or a cow? I was raised on a farm. I didn't worship them. I ate them. I don't know about you. You know, somebody told me, he said, well, what are you? And I said, well, I'm a second generation vegetarian. You know what that is? The cows eat the grass and I eat the cows. That's just the way it is with me. And, you know, uh, but see, it's Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is no other salvation. Who in the world wants to worship? You know, when the children of Israel were going to the promised land, you know, and they got discouraged because Moses was up on the mountain. They hadn't seen him in a while. And they created an animal to worship. This is your God. How stupid can you be and want to worship an animal? My God, I tell you, some of the animals I kill, some of them I eat, and some of them I want to get rid of. Anybody here want a chihuahua? I got a chihuahua that's a little, little tiny guy, but he's bipolar. You know, I, I tell you, he, this, this little guy is cute as can be, but if I'm in the recliner resting, he comes over and he wants me to pick him up. And so I reach down and I pick him up and I put him there and he gets right between my legs and he lays there. But from the time I put him up there, I cannot touch him. If I try to touch, he'll bite me. Dear Lord, how stupid can he be? So, you know, here, here's the thing. Jesus Christ is a savior of the world. Peter mentioned to the religious leaders in Acts 4, he said, there's salvation in Noah, no one else. God has given to, given to no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. And the Bible says when those religious leaders heard Peter and John begin to explain how this crippled man got healed, it says they realized he had been with Jesus. What a wonderful testimony that people could look at us and say, I don't know, I may not understand everything you say, but I believe you've been with Jesus. Amen. Amen? Peter, you know, in, in Acts 3, Peter went over and, and they were going up to the temple to pray. And here's a guy that's crippled. He's been there for uh, every day for years. And Peter said, I don't have any money, but what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You see, we need to understand Jesus is not only the Savior of the world, but through his name, there is all power in heaven and in earth and underneath this earth. He's given us power and authority over all the works of the enemy. Amen? You know, here's one of the things. There's a lot of ministers that do motivational sermons, but they never mention Jesus. I don't understand that. How could you be a pastor? How could you be a minister and never mention Jesus? Jesus Christ. My wife and I, we don't travel much in, uh, anymore, and, but uh, we come up here every year, the end of September and the first part of October, but that's about it. And, but I have a, a missionary friend. He travels around about every two to three months here in the United States and ministers at different churches. And he'd come back and he'd tell me, he said, you don't realize how many churches there are that never preach Jesus, never give an imitation for salvation, never talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and never pray for people. I don't understand that. And, and you know, you and I must understand the power that is in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I tell you, I have, I have seen, well, I, could, I could tell you a bunch of stories. Some of them are here on, this, on these thumb drives. Uh, I remember... When I first really, after I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I was still learning, I didn't know a whole lot. And I remember I went, uh, I was going to India to preach in a new church over there. And uh, a friend of mine suggested I stop off in the Philippines and I did. And so this guy, this minister that I was working with over there, he took me out to a little village. You have to understand I'd never done anything like this in my life. 
He took me out to a village to do a crusade. There on this little, this island, we're on the beach. Here's the ocean behind me. And my platform was two kitchen tables put together. Together, my platform was about this square. That was it. So they get up, they sing, they worship God. And they said, okay, now you got to preach. So I got up and I began to tell people about Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, that he's the savior of the world, you know, and, and all, and that he's the great healer and everything. And after I finished preaching, I gave an invitation. There was about a hundred people there. I gave an invitation, about 25 people got saved. I said, okay, now I'm going to pray for people that, that need healing. Never done this before. You understand? Never. And the, they came forward and the first person was a man walking on crutches, an old man walking on crutches. And I thought, my God, couldn't I start with something simple? I had it. Anyway, I got a headache, you know, or whatever. And so I just, I just reached over and I laid my hand on his, on his head. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And he looked up at me and I said, you think God healed you? Yeah. Really? He said, yeah. You're sure? Oh, yeah. I said, you think you could walk now without those crutches? He said, yeah. I said, so he handed them to me. I'm up on this little this table and he starts to take a step and he almost fell. My heart jumped up into my throat. I closed my eyes. I learned that you can pray a prayer and get an answer just like that. It doesn't take a long time. I closed my eyes. I said, oh God, don't let him fall because if he falls, the people in this village may think we're, we're some kind of stupid people. I said, don't let him fall. And I opened and got, this is what God said. You're not the healer. He said, you're not the healer. He said, I am. He said, all I ever told you to do, you can lay hands on people, you can pray a prayer of faith, but he said, I am the healer. It all happened in a split second. And I opened my eyes and he didn't fall. He began to walk. And as he's walking, all of a sudden, here comes a bunch of little boys and girls and they're following him. And they're so happy and rejoicing. And I thought, my Lord, what's going on? And there's a woman standing here in front of me and she's crying. I said, what are, you, what are you crying about? She said, you don't understand. Everybody in this village knows that man. He's never walked without crutches in over 40 years. I said, go get a pic picture of that guy. And they had to run to catch him. But people that were in their homes, they were listening to it. And when they saw what happened to this man, they came out of their home. And so we had a much bigger crowd. And I preached again and had more people saved after that. The power of the name of Jesus Christ, not only for salvation, but for healing and deliverance and everything else that you can think of. Then from there, I went to, to India. I'm feeling pretty good. And so, you know, I get there. And, and so, I mean, I'm preaching in a service. There's, I don't know, several hundred people there. They're all sitting on the ground. The women over here, the men over here. And so I, I, it, it comes time, they did praise and worship and it comes time for me to preach. And just as I stood up to preach, all of a sudden, there's a girl back here in the back. She starts screaming and falling on the ground. She's rolling around and screaming. And some of the women, they grab her, they're trying to hold her, they're trying to control her and they're rebuking and they're binding and nothing changed. And I'm, I'm standing there looking and saying, never seen anything like that in my life. And, and you know, uh, finally they picked her up and they brought her up to the front and then they took her inside of a house. And I could hear them screaming and hollering and, and rebuking and binding. And I could hear her screaming and hollering. And the guy said, okay, go ahead and preach. Listen, I don't know what I preached that night. But what I, what I discovered was when I finished preaching, I said, okay, I, take me back to the hotel. And he said, oh, no, I cannot take you to the hotel. You, you, you must go in the house there and you must pray for that girl. I said, well, no, I'm really tired. No, no, you must go. See, I'm practicing. The next time I go to India, I don't have to have an interpreter. <laughs> huh? So anyway, so here I go. They take me in the house. I'm, I'm saying, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And they took me into this room. It was full of people. This girl's laying on the floor and there's... One woman holding one leg, another woman holding another leg, another holding an arm, another holding an arm. One of them had her hand on their stomach and another had a head of her hair. Uh, I don't have hair, so. Anyway, and they said, okay, go ahead. I, 
never seen anything like this before in my life. So I go over and I kneel and, and I mean, I'm, I'm grabbing her hold her hand. She's pulling back and forth like this. And, I, and I'm saying, oh, you know, I don't know what to do. And finally I said, look, I want everybody to get out of this room. Except I want a couple of women with this girl and a couple of pastors with me. I want everybody else out because this is not a show. Okay, this, this is serious business. So they got everybody out but two women and two pastors. And so I'm kneeling there and I've got her by the arms and she's pulling and pulling. And I said, I rebuke you. I bind you. Come out of her and all this. And nothing happened. It was at that moment I discovered the most powerful prayer I could ever pray in my life. The most powerful prayer. Would you like to know what that prayer is? Huh? It's kind of a secret. Don't tell anybody. This is the most powerful prayer I've ever prayed in my life. Help! That was it. I'm telling you, that was my prayer. Help! And God spoke to me. And here's one of the things I discovered. God will come down to your level. I didn't know all about deliverance, but God came down. And this is what I heard in my spirit. Nobody interpreted what I said. I just said, and, and this, is, this is the only thing I knew to do right then. I said, I plead the blood of Jesus over this girl. When I said that, she stopped moving. I looked at her. I stood up. I'm standing over her looking like this. I'm thinking, oh God, did she die? And all of a sudden she opened her eyes. She got up. She raised her hands up toward heaven. And she said, I'm free. I'm free. Amen. Wow. Later, and now I'm getting some pretty good practice. Later, I was in another church and I start to preach and there's a young boy falls out on, in the aisle. He starts wiggling down toward the front like a snake. And I just stood there and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of him. He was totally set free. Amen. Another time Lynn was with me and we were in India and we preached a, a, a meeting and we got ready to leave and we were getting ready to get in the car. And one of the pastors brought a man to me and all you could see was just his face and his hands. He was just covered all over. And they said, this man wants you to pray for him. I said, okay, what, what's his problem? They said, uh, he's got leprosy. I, I said, uh, he's got what? They said, he got leprosy. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to risk one finger. So I reach this one finger out and I put it here in his forehead. My wife of great faith laid hands on me. And so I said, I take authority over this leprosy. I command it to leave and for this man to be completely healed in Jesus' name. <clears throat> The next night in the meeting, while they're doing praise and worship, the guy in charge of the service said, anybody here got a testimony? And all of a sudden there's a man way back there at the back. He starts running to the front and said, let me testify, let me testify. And as he's running to the front, he starts taking off his shirt. I'm thinking, oh God, in, in Mexico we do this, you know, it's protecting the cross, you know. So I'm thinking, oh God, what do we got here? And they grabbed him, they took him over to the side and they said, he let him testify. He stood up in front of the people. He took off his shirt and said, look at me. Last night I came with leprosy. But look at me tonight. I'm totally healed. <laughs> Things that I've learned about the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Another time... We were, I mean, a lot of these stories are old stories, but they're, they're stories that, that made an impact on my life and changed me in many ways. We were doing this, this crusade, there was about 500 people there, and I got up and I preached about Jesus. And, you know, and, and I had been told that, you know, in India, probably 60% of the people in India are Hindus. 
and about 30% are Muslims, and then there's only like 2% that are Christians. And so, you know, with the, with the Hindus, if you tell them about a God, about Jesus, they'll say, oh, very good. I will add his name to my list of other gods. Very good. And I said, let me tell you something. He's not like all the other gods. There's only one. He's the savior of the world. And I said, you know what? I'm going to demonstrate that he is the savior of the world. I said, anybody here that you've brought somebody that's deaf, they came here. They brought up seven people up to the platform. Again, I had never done anything like this in my life. We lined them up on the platform. I went by one by one and I laid my hands on them and I prayed and asked God to touch and heal each one of them so that they could hear. When I finished praying for them, then I would have them turn around, look at the, at the people and I would be behind them and I would say something like this, praise God. They'd say, praise God. They'd say, I'd say, hallelujah. They'd say, hallelujah. All seven could begin to hear. But one young man, when I said hallelujah, he'd go, hallelujah. He could hear what I was saying, but he couldn't pronounce it. And I said, God, what's wrong with this man? Do I need to pray for him again? And God said, he's never spoken before. He's just now learning how to speak and pronounce words. So he can't speak clearly because he's never spoken clearly before. And this boy got totally healed. And for the next several days when we were there, he followed me around everywhere I went, holding my hand and kissing my hand and just telling me how much he loved God and, and all how God had worked a miracle. Well, when God healed those seven people, I said, all right, I have proven to you, I have driven, demonstrated to you the power of the name of Jesus Christ. I said, now, I, I give you an invitation. If you want to receive Christ, turn away from all other gods, you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I said, I want you to stand up. Well, there was about 500 people there. About 200 people stood. Now, you must understand, I had never seen that many people get saved at one time. So I told my interpreter, I said, they don't understand, have them sit back down. So I go over the plan of salvation one more time. I said, if you really want to receive Christ, stand up. About 250 people stood. I said, they don't understand. Have them sit back down. They sat back down. I, gave, I went through the plan of salvation again. I gave an invitation. And I said, how many want to receive Christ? And more people stood. I looked at my interpreter. I said, they don't understand. He said, no, you do not understand. They know why they're standing up. They're standing up to receive Christ. You need to pray for them. You know, I mean, just, but, but what I, I've shared these stories with you to let you know that there is power, not only for salvation, but there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And you and I have been given that name to use. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, number three of what I consider to be very important is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you haven't received it, you need to receive it. I tell you, I was raised as a Baptist. I pastored two Baptist churches, but I had a brother that was a Baptist pastor, but he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and he began to tell me about it. And I tell you, this is back in the early 60s. <laughs> Most of you don't even know what the early 60s was like, you know? And so there was hardly anything, books or anything that you could get literature on the baptism. There's so little stuff and in fact, the, the Baptist condemned it. And, you know, I, my, the pastor that was over me, you know, when he, uh, he, he preached against it. But anyway, I, I watched my brother and to look at his life and other ministers that, were, that he was working with. And I saw the impact that they had wherever they went and the people that got saved and healed. And finally, I came to the point, I said, God, I don't understand all about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I said, this one thing I know. If you have something for me that will enable me to reach more souls for Christ, I want it. 
I don't care who it joins me to. I don't care who it separates me from. If it's from you and will enable me to reach more people, I want it now. And so in a period of time, I went and got with my brother. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It changed my life forever. I ended up uh, leaving the Baptist and joining up with my brother in Houston. And my life and ministry was totally changed because of the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, this is one of the things we need to encourage people today. And, and I, look, I look at the early disciples in the book of Acts. Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, he said, I command you. It wasn't a suggestion. He said, I command you to wait here in Jerusalem until you receive the promise from, of, of God, which he was talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, I don't want you to leave until you receive it. <laughs> you know, I had people one day say, tell me, well, you know, if you really want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem. So if you want to receive the baptism, you got to go to Jerusalem. You know, that's one of those stupid things. But anyway, I received it sitting in the back seat of a car in downtown Houston in all the traffic. That's where I got it. But I tell you, it changed my life. It'll change your life. The power of of the Holy Spirit. And, I, and over all of these years of ministry, and I told you I've been preaching for 57 years, all of, all of these years, I love seeing the power of God manifested. It makes a difference. It brings, it brings Christ and God alive. Amen. Amen? And, and, you know, I mean, we, we need to understand the, the thing it tells us. We can read in the Bible of all of the different miracles that, that they did. In, in the book of Acts and everything, people getting healed, people getting delivered, and all of these, all of these things that happen. And, and I think, dear God, I want, to, I want to be there. I remember one time that, that I had already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I was, I, was, I was just, it was still new to me. And I remember I was driving down the highway, and I, and I said, God, I remember that in the book of Acts, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I said, I remember that in, in, they, in chapter 2, they began to speak in tongues. And the Bible says 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And I said, I remember reading in chapter 3 where a crippled man that had been crippled for many years, how he was healed. And then in chapter 4 of how many people received Christ as their personal Savior because of the healing of this man. And all of these many dear miracles. And, and, and you know, and, and, and again, you understand this was all, a lot of this was all new to me. And, and reading the rest of the book of Acts and, and just the miracles and the power of God manifested. And, and I, I, I was praying. I said, God, I wish I could have lived back in the Bible days. I wish I could have lived back in the days of miracles. And God said, days never performed one miracle. The days had nothing to do with it. And then he told me these things. Number one, you want what they had? You want to do what they did? He said, number one, you got the same God they had. The same God they worshiped, the same God they believed in, you've got the same God. He said, number two, you have the same uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. The same Jesus that saved Peter, James, and John, and Paul, and all these others. He said, you've got the same Jesus. He said, you have the same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that came upon them is, is the same Holy Spirit that's come upon you. He has empowered you. You have the same Holy Spirit that Paul and Peter and John and all these other guys that they had. And then, then he said, you have the same commission on your life that they had on theirs. He told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what they began to do. And uh, uh, I mean... That word from God, it changed my life. And, you know, I, I, I realize that in me is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. In you, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The Savior of the world. The Holy Spirit that has all power. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. This is one of the reasons you and I can live a victorious life. We are more than conquerors in this life. Do you know that? Yes. We're more than conquerors. Yes. Wow. We have the same Holy Spirit in us. It gives us power.
power to do the work of God. Number four, faith is a way of life. Amen. 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 We live by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Number five, God still works miracles. Yes, he He's the miracle work in God. Yes, he He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now let me mention these other things real quickly. Number six, never let pride control your life. Amen. I tell you, I have seen ministers, I've seen individuals, all of a sudden they get pride and they think they're God. Bless their little old hearts. Number eight, love people. Teach them the word of God. Minister to their needs. Number nine, be generous. If you want the blessings of God, you need to be generous. Be thankful. Number 10, no, number 11, remember KISS. K-I-S-S. -S. What in the world is that? Keep it simple, stupid. Somebody said, I'm just looking for the deeper things of God. Hey, you don't even understand the simple things of God. You know, one of the things that I discovered, I don't know if any of you are ever going to a, a mission field or whatever, but did you know the majority of people today do not understand and know the simple things of the Bible? They don't know those things. When I was a kid, I was raised up. We went to church, but first of all, I, one hour I was in Sunday school. Then we went to, to the worship service. Most churches don't even have Sunday school for kids or anything like that. And so we have to keep our message very, very simple. And then we always give people an opportunity to receive Christ. I heard a story several years ago that, that really ministered to me. There was some, a man... They call him Dr. Alexander Duff. He was from Scotland and he went to India and he spent almost all of his life as a missionary in the country of India. And he got into be, to poor health and finally he had to leave India and he went back home. And so, and so he had major health problems. His age, I forgot how old he was. But they asked if he would come to a graduation of a seminary of a Bible school that they had. And so he got up there and he began to share with them about reaching the world for Christ. And he challenged many of them to go to the country of India. And he said, how many of you would go to India? Nobody raised their hand. And he began pleading with them. And all of a sudden he felt so bad, he fell over on the floor. And they went over and they picked him up and they said, hey, okay, go ahead, go sit down. He said, no. Give me just one more minute. He said, I have challenged you to go to India and preach the gospel. But nobody has responded. He said, I'll tell you this. I will go back to India. And if I don't do anything else but lay down by the Gandhi's River and die there, the people of India will know that there is a God that loves them. And so I know that we challenge people to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I think of that, you know, I think of Lynn and I. You know, we've lived in Mexico for 43 years. And, you know, we've talked about, somebody said, well, why don't you leave? Things have gotten dangerous and all this. If, if we left Mexico, I'd have to get a job and work. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> anyway, these are things that I, I just share with you that if I never see you again, these are the things that I think that are so important for every one of you. I want to do one other thing. How many of you got a right hand? You got a right hand? Hold it up. Put it on the top of your head. I believe in the laying on of hands. I can't come and lay hands on you, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to make this confession with me. And I do it every day. I've been doing this for at least two years or more. Make this confession with me. I believe the blessings of the Lord are upon my life. I believe prosperity is coming to me today. I have divine health in my body. I have peace in my heart. I have favor with God and man. I have the victory over all the works of the enemy. 
and I'm more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember all these things, they're free. Praise God. So what we're gonna do right now, um, we're gonna give y'all the opportunity to give and to sow into Bobby and Lynn Crow's ministry and into their lives. And so uh, with that being said, um, if you haven't passed the envelopes already, can you please do that now? Um, same thing in second year. Um, the, the, the word that the Lord put on my heart for this offering um, is actually gonna be partnership. And so you guys and y'all in second year are learning and have learned awesome spiritual truths about the power of seeds and the power of what money can do in people's lives. And so in, in this particular offering, I really believe that God's wanting y'all to partner and sow into what the crows have done and what they're gonna continue to do. All the lives that are gonna be touched, all the, all the people that are gonna be delivered and set free, all the people who are coming to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus. You know, in uh, John 4, and it's, I believe it's verse 35 through 38, it talks about like lift up your eyes and see that the fields are already white with harvest. And it talks about how those who sow and those who labor, those who reap, they're gonna be rejoicing together. Every seed and every, everything that y'all put into this, I believe that the, the reach that the Crow's ministry and what the Holy Spirit do, has done and is gonna continue to do, when we get to heaven and when we see that, we're gonna, we're gonna be rejoicing together. And this opportunity, so you know, they've planted, from my understanding, roughly 30 churches. But that, that person that came up to them and said, hey listen, like, I went to your guys' school and I did over, like we've planted 50 churches here in Mexico. The, the, the reach of the seed that you guys sow, you might not see in this life and you might not even see the impact of it, but it is, it is tremendous. And lives are being changed. And this is, this is a couple that for you know, 56 years have put their money where, the mouth, where their mouth is. This is good soil. This is a good opportunity. And this is a good place to invest and to sow and, and to partner with. And so I want to give you guys that encouragement. And in the same way you know, that their ministry is reaching far more people than they even realize I really believe that the, that the Lord put this on my heart that this offering that we sow is gonna be, it's gonna reach way further than y'all realize. You guys are gonna be touching lives and impacting eternities. And when we get to heaven and we see the, the full fruition of that fruit, we're gonna see the impact. You guys are gonna be tremendously blessed. This is a multi-generational offering. And I really encourage you guys to give like, like that's true, because it is. So we love y'all, and at this time, I just want to pray and bless, uh, bless this time and, and bless the offering. So, Father, we just thank you. We love and thank you for, for Bobby and Lynn sending them here and blessing us. We thank you for the blessing on their life and the blessing that they've been throughout Mexico, India, and, and many other nations, everything that you're doing. God, I thank you for this offering and, and the seed that we're sowing. We just speak a blessing over this, increase over this, blessing everybody's lives. We thank you that this word that Bobby just spoke um, really ignites in our hearts and that, that that bears fruit. We just love and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can just, for this offering, it's going to be for Bobby. So you can, once again, you can kind of just put it to Karis Bible College and we'll make sure that it gets to them, okay? God bless you all.